Uh, my name is Brenton Linhart. I am uh, a manager at Red Hat. I work in the space of CI, shipping OpenShift, building OpenShift. Um, I see a few people walking in. Uh, my guess is Dan Walsh's talk has totally fi filled up, and that's why you're coming in. So <laughs> I have, I have a, a, an offer for anybody who, who uh, just got stuck in this talk here. Um, I'm going to do a hack fest. This is not on the schedule. It's not on, this is kind of unscripted. Uh, we can do it after this, this talk, or we can do it at lunchtime. It'll only be 15, 20 minutes tops. So you're probably thinking, OK, he said manager at Red Hat. This is probably um, you know, some, some trick to uh, get me to do work. Uh, that's, that's probably what's going on here. Or you know, 10, 10, 15 minutes, what could we, what could we really do in 15 minutes? That, that, sounds, that sounds really, really awkward. Well, I, truth be told, this is a hacky sack fest. So there will be no computers, no technology, uh, just you know, moving, our, moving our bodies just a little bit. Uh, the thing about hacky sack here, and it, it is going to relate to this talk, but in open source, it's like hacky sacking. You can, you can do it with other people, and you can sneak it into any job you can possibly think of. You know, even, I guess, professional baseball players play hacky sack. Well, this hacky sack here, this is mine. Uh, it's, it's unique. It is filled with lentils. That's, that's uh, kind of strange. No plastic. Um, but it actually relates to SRE in, in, a, in a small way. I was walking through my city. And I was at a park, and I saw people playing hacky sack. And I said, hey, uh, this is great. Like I said, it's collaborative. You can just jump in. So I start playing with them, and I immediately notice something surprising. They are playing with my hacky sack. And I just, I just ask them, I say, hey, that's my hacky sack. Where did, you, where did you get this? And they said they found it at this park. And I can, you know, we talked a little bit. We just realized, surely my kids were at this park either the day before or today. And they just left it here. And OK, well, that's great. They gave it back to me. That was, that was fantastic. I got my hacky sack back. I didn't even know my hacky sack was missing. Now, this is where, when you are pursuing the maximum change on a large software project, there's a class of problems that, 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 slow, that slow these projects down. It, it can be the end. It can be like the end of, of projects. And oftentimes, you don't even see these things. You don't even know that they're happening. These would be sometimes just called, you just write them off as test flakes. It's just these tests fail over here sometimes. Sometimes it all just works, and then another set of tests fail. And, and you don't really know something bad is going on. I didn't know my hacky sack was missing. And if someone said, Brenton, your hacky sack is missing, I wouldn't just say, well, I'm going to just walk through my city, and surely I'll find it. You know, that, that is, luck is, is not a good strategy. And, and that's also not a good strategy for fixing these, these what I'm going to just call marginal losses, these, these 1% to 2% decreases in your stability of your product that happen every couple weeks. They add up to just to be the ruin of, of large projects. So instead of luck, we need, we need a more disciplined approach. And SRE is uh, what we're finding that wor is working for us. And I just. You know, that's what it, most of my talk is going to be about SRE thinking and how it gets you into basically as fast as you possibly can go on your team. So I learned about it eight years ago through this book, uh, free PDF. Google's been doing SRE for like 20 years now. And uh, a great way to just think about it uh, in simple terms is you will have developers on one side of the spectrum. They're working with their customers. It's really in their advantage to, to change all the time. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you would have uh, operations. And for them, things only go wrong when there is change. They, they actually would prefer if there's not a whole lot of change. And so it, it's not being malicious, but there will be barriers that will be erected. And, and these two teams can feel like they're at odds with each other. So SRE is in the middle and is really trying to make sure an organization can speed up when they can sustain it and slow down when they need to slow down. So here is uh, just a fantastic way to, to, to think about it. Like Our goal as SRE is to innovate as fast as possible 
but no faster. Does anyone have an idea? Raise your, I mean, do you know where this, this is kind of a famous quote? Does anybody know where it came from? Okay, I lied. I have no idea where it came from. It's actually a riff on an Einstein quote. I, I swear it was in that book. It was not in the book. So it was some SRE person who, who said it. Because uh, there's a lot of flavors of SRE. Google's not the only one that does it. Uh, there are some tenets that are, that are shared among most, most flavors. You'll have service level objectives, goals that your customers actually care about. If you miss them, it's, it's going to really matter. So you, you want to have some metrics, and you want to keep track of those. You're monitoring to know, like, are we, are we meeting their expectations? Are we missing? And you can't just you know, stare at a metrics all day long. You, you really need to have robots doing that for you and alerting you when there is something that you need to look at. And when that alert fires, generally that's what SREs will call toil. It's just work that it has to be done. It may be maybe halfway automated, uh, maybe may not be the perfect solution. It may be a workaround. It might be rolling back to the previous version. But the goal is you just have to reduce these things over time uh, because otherwise they, they, they will grow. Now, of these four tenets, there's really one more, and that is simplicity. This ties all of the tenets together with SRE, and I, I'm going to kind of build on this on how uh, simplicity is really what allows SRE to scale. Because you might have, um, you know, on the product you work on and the project you work on, you may have someone who's there since version zero. And if you hit whatever problem you hit, they can just kind of, you know, get into a meditative state, close their eyes, and they can reason through whatever problem you're facing. That, that does not scale when your team maybe doubles every year for a while or it's been around for a decade, you will never be able to have enough of those people. Those people will not want to do that job all the time. We need, we need a process that is simple so that you can bring more, more, uh, more people into it. So for us, it, it really made a lot of sense for SRE. The thing that was a little surprising, though, is we are not, we're not the typical SRE organization. We are a product team. So I'm not like OpenShift, the hosted, we, we run it for you. This is the product team for OpenShift. But it makes sense for our CI environment. It's mission critical for hundreds of developers. It has thousands of machines. And it serves millions of requests. It really, I mean, these are tests. These are our, our, uh, our this is our environment. So it, for us, SRE is not, we just keep a whole bunch of machines running. That's not, that's not really our goal. Our service is can you understand what CI is telling you? Are, 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 is our product getting better? Is it getting worse? When you have a billion tests every quarter to deal with, that's kind of tricky. And if our CI signal is offline, like that, that's a problem. CI, our, being able to understand CI is, is our metric. So think about the, uh, the four tenets that I was just showing. You add in simplicity. Uh, here, here's, an, here's an actual quote, no jokes. Um, if the foundation of SRE is simplicity, implementing it should be simple. So uh, does anyone know who this is? Raise your hand if you think this came from like one of maybe one of the keynote speakers at our conference. You know, this is, uh, um, OK, uh, this is actually. This is actually from me, and it's totally, totally wrong. Uh, implementing it is the hardest part. The, it's, it's very easy. You, can, you don't even have to read the whole SRE book. You can just skim through it and think, like, this makes total sense. Why didn't, why didn't I think of this? It's, it's the social challenges that you face when, uh, when bringing it into an environment. Like I said, we were not uh, a, a team that had decades of SRE experience. The culture doesn't just flow through the hallways uh, on the teams that we're on. So when we come to a team to, to work with them and we say, you know, hi, we're the uh, CI SRE team, you know, they typically have two questions. The first one is, like, who are you? And we, we tell them, oh, what we do is we're trying to have the maximum rate of innovation. We have these. And then the second question is, what? Like, this, is, this makes no sense to me. So 
I want to tell uh, another story, no hacky sacks here. This is a story of how we used SRE, and we went from, let's just say, like all caps, angry messages in Slack in our direction, to sometimes getting thanked a little bit, to eventually having developers uh, join in um, in this journey with us. Now, I mentioned toil a few slides ago. Uh, oftentimes in a traditional, you know, let's just say the, the GitHub environments that, that Jen is talking about, uh, if, if something goes wrong, they'll just roll back to the previous version. That's, that's oftentimes the easiest thing to do rather than iterating in production of, well, let's see. I mean, we're totally offline right now. Let me give it a shot and see if I can fix it. No, you just, you just go back to the previous version. So we, we really apply that to our CI environment. So we can integrate code. We can actually disintegrate code. So we're, we're reverting code that has been found to make our product worse. And we started on this about two years ago. And we, we very quickly learned that you know, one does not simply revert someone else's code. It's one thing to revert your own code. But when you, you, know, you don't make a lot of friends in that initial reaction. And really, the, the challenges of this slide right here is like worth a whole other talk. So I'd love to, to come back and give that. Uh, but really, I want to talk about how we, were, we became trusted with, with this responsibility. Um, that's, that's really the, the social challenge that, um, that we faced when, when implementing SRE and CI. So we had to, we had to convince ourselves that, that this is really worth it, because you know, we did this once or twice. And you know, it, didn't, it didn't go so well the first couple times. It felt like we were you know, showing favorites or didn't have a lot of standard operating procedures. So we went, uh, we talked with our, our data scientists. We really needed to know, like, this is going to actually help, help us. So they came up with this model. And it showed that, indeed, if, if we make our product worse every release, we may not have another version of our product. So in, real, in, in reality, we, we made some tools that could uh, help us see how our product was getting better or, or worse. You can click on this one. It's all the data is, is public. Uh, this is just the, the main landing dashboard. I'll show you a couple other features. But the key thing we had to shift for all our teams was just thinking in terms of an SLO. The SLO was we have to make our product better every release. Everybody could get on board with that. We just had to be able to justify you know, if we're going to take any kind of dramatic steps, like reverting someone else's code, that code is their, is their hard work. It's their promises to their customers. You know, we cannot do that that lightly. Uh, so this is, we, we're now, you know, thinking in terms of SLOs. We all agree we have to make our product better. Uh, but to get, you know, we're not having pizza parties every time code gets reverted uh, just quite yet. We had to take another step that we borrowed from SRE, and that's that every page should be actionable. You know, 20 years ago, I guess Google engineers were carrying pagers uh, on their hips. Uh, well, if that thing goes off, you better be able to do something about it. And for us, you know, our main interaction is, is a bug. It has, to be, it has to be something that somebody can do something with. So I'm going to, here's a little dramatization. I will play the developer, and this is something that plays out for us you know, a couple times a week, um, and let's say CISRE sends me a message and is like, hey, Brenton, um, this is really weird. What do you think about this? And they send me a, an error message, and I think, well, I mean, to be honest, you know, this, this is OpenShift. It's built on Kubernetes. It's eventually consistent. It's distributed. It's really big. Um, this could just be normal operations. Something could just be like, shifting, you know, rebalancing. And, you know, that error message is not, not super concerning. And they say, well, uh, we saw it six times. Uh, you know, what do you think? And I'm, I'm like, I'm, not, I'm still not convinced. I mean, do you have any other data uh, that shows me, you know, like, how often this is happening? Because Kubernetes is fantastic at hiding all kinds of problems. It's meant, it's on, it has the assumption that not everything is going to be working all the time. So it, it, it's kind of built into the architecture. So they show me, they say, well, here's the timeline of events uh, that I found causes this. And that's pretty remarkable that they, they show, like, OK, that's interesting. Like, that timeline, that is a real problem. That, 
oh my gosh, like thankfully Kubernetes like has our back. It's like protecting us from these kind of things. And they said, well, actually like this is a new problem. It's only started happening this morning. And I think, really? Uh, that's interesting. Uh, and then they show me my pull request. And they say, hey, this pull request, right after it merged, this problem started happening. And it actually means that 15% of the time, our product's not going to install on a you know, critical platform. And now, you know, it's Friday afternoon. I'm like sending them the, the, the sweat emoji on, on Slack. I'm, I'm a little stressed out. And they, they pick up on it and they say, oh, wait a second. Uh, here's the bug. We've actually already reverted your code. Uh, it's not in. You don't have to worry because I'm panicked that it's going live like very soon. But now I'm, I'm like relaxing and I'm thinking it's Friday afternoon. I, I'm, I'm just going to start my weekend at this point. Uh, I'm going to come back on Monday energized and, and we're going to solve this problem uh, the right way. Because I, I mean, we want my, everybody wants the feature in. You know, we're working together here, so that's where we get uh, a little closer. It's not actually pizza parties uh, every time we revert code, but this is a, a service that we that we sort of say we we offer. Uh, we try to lighten the mood a little bit with with um, you know this was a, a dolly generated image. <laughs> so um, now how do how do they know what to revert? You know how did how did they catch me? I'm the developer. I actually want to know how you caught me because I want to catch, I want to catch me next time. You know, you shouldn't have to do this. So this is simplicity. The tenant, all we're really doing is bisecting problems. This is a tool you can go to that we had to create it. We had to create the ability to diff versions of OpenShift. It's not a mono repo. It's actually over a hundred repos plus an entire immutable operating system that makes up OpenShift. And that immutable operating system is is, is so critical because we know every change that happened in between one version of OpenShift and another. And this tool will give us the diff. And our goal is we have another SLO. It's, this is a diff SLO. We want to keep it the diff very short between the last thing we knew what was working and all the changes. Because when that happens, we can catch things within hours. We can just say, wait a second, why are installs not working on this platform? Where's Brenton? Like, that's what we can do that within, within hours. And it works really, really well. Uh, and it's, it's simple that where we, we can bring people, it didn't require the, the person who's been on the team 10 years to find the bug. It's like the person who's been on our team six months who didn't even know Kubernetes before he joined Red Hat. And they're able to catch really deep problems in the code. So I mentioned like the last known good thing. Last known good is a term in, in SRE. You'll find it in, in a lot of books. Uh, what is it in our case? We have a couple different ways of describing the last known good version of OpenShift. I'm going to show you what I think is the most interesting one that, that we've come up with. Remember the SLO that we have to get, make OpenShift better every single release. So let's see, laser pointer, awesome. Um, you look at this, maybe you've seen like Kubernetes test grid. You might think, oh, okay, this is a bunch of tests and this is like instances of the test running. Here's some failing tests right here. Uh, this is not what this is. We are looking at trends. We have a billion test runs every quarter. Uh, we do not care if a test is failing. Uh, these are pieces of OpenShift uh, products that, I mean, uh, components that, that map to teams. And these, are, these would be platforms, uh, you know, combinations of things that we really care about. And these are interesting trends for us. And we are comparing the last version, like basically the month of time before we GA'd uh, our previous version, uh, I think it says 4.16 versus 4.17. And it says, okay, the, the month before we GA'd 4.16 is probably the most stable period of 4.16. Look at all those test pass rates and find me tests that are now passing less often than they were, than they were a while ago. And this data is looking at a week of development versus the last month of our previous release. And we didn't make this, this math up. Uh, this is very simple statistics. Uh, you might have heard of like a, a significance test called the chi-square test from like a, a st statistics class. We use the Fisher's exact test because it works really well when you have sample sizes that are different. So we have a big sample size over here. That would be all our historical data. And then we have, you know, maybe some tests we've run in the last hour or the last week. And that's why we care more. We don't care if a test is failing 100% of the time, all the time. 
or 50% of the time, all the time. Someone else will care, probably the people paying for the, the bills of the testing, but our, our concern is that if a test went from 99.9% .9 passing to 94.9% .9 passing in a few hours, that's when those things turn red and we you know, get, get into action to start debugging what could have caused this. Like, where's Brenton? He did it again somehow. So this tool, if you, if you click on it, um, will give you uh, these little reports like this. You, if, you, if you were to go to this link, uh, you'll get a table. There'll be some red things on the side, some squares. You click on those, you get these reports. These are the reports that help the SREs uh, file actionable bugs. They can come to me. The only thing that really matters here is this little stuff in, circled in pink. It says, there's a 99.98% .98 chance, Brenton, that it, it's not just bad luck. It's not random. Like there's an actual problem. We need you to investigate. So what they're showing here is this is like the last month, all this, this stuff over here, the last month before we G8 our previous release. Here's some test failures right here that have happened this week. And they're not random. And Brenton, we're not saying it's your fault. Uh, we're just saying we need you to file any bug, talk to any team, revert any code, do whatever it takes to make sure we do not ship this because we're all in this to make our product better every single release. We, we're not doing our jobs if we don't do that. So in my, in my words that I use to describe this, you may have heard what sounds a little bit like blameless culture. We're not saying Brenton, like, come on, you did it again. You know, it's really just, Brenton, we need your help to, to find out what, what is causing your component to be less awesome than it was. So we, we do adopt a little bit of blameless culture from like incident management and SRE, but we, we are not, I mean, I, I see people I work with here, we, you know, we're not perfect at this. Uh, I myself, like this week, uh, devolved into, on Monday, devolved into blaming uh, Dark Lord Entropy for all our problems. This is our fictional being that, instead of blaming people, we just, we make fake posters that's, I, I mean, I think we need a keynote just about the importance of uh, silly videos and images you can make with AI. Because we have a lot of fun with that. We have fake, um, fake letters, have a fake GitHub account, so please don't tell Jen. Uh, this is just a little bit of fun we have, but that's because the, the interactions of reverting people's code is, it's not, it's never fun. That's like the last, last resort. We want to minimize these types of reactions these types of interactions, and that's where we, we get into toil reduction because they're, they're high touch. They're like a team of SREs and, and discussions, and uh, we, wanna, we wanna reduce these types of things. So uh, a couple of things that we do to uh, reduce toil uh, is we, we just sort of divide our SRE team into there's people that are on call, and there's, they're, they're the ones that are looking at the data during their work day, all day long, and they find, they find weird things like this every single day. Then we have people that are entirely focused uh, on adding new features to our service, the service of letting people understand what, uh, is, what our CI data is, is telling them. Now we find that that split, um, you know, is it really, there's like a magic number. We've been doing this for like two years now. It's uh, we, we used to be on call for like two or three days at a time. Then we say, well, let's do a whole week. Now we, we switch, switch to like two weeks on, like three weeks off. That's kind of how, how we do it because we found that there is a magic number. Like 51% is the magic number of doom. If you are working more than 50% of the time on toil, uh, it's, it's just not going to end well. You, it, the team's going to burn out. It's going to, be, it's going to be terrible in the long run. Uh, we get this, honestly, from, from this book. They talk a lot about how like 50% is, is really, you don't want to get anywhere uh, near that. Uh, and you need, to take, you need to take action when you start to approach half of your time just going to just firefighting. Uh, it's, it's a very high stress environment. You know, I, you know, I sound like I'm really selling this really well. You probably want to join my team. Uh, but uh, what I mean is, when things get really bad, we have other ways. Uh, this is a talk about the maximum rate, about speeding innovation and change up. Well, sometimes we actually have to slow down. 
we have to, we, we are authorized even to put restrictions in Git to say certain types of changes can't merge. We've had to do some like really kind of tragic, exotic things that uh, we, don't, we don't like to do, but, we, but we, will, we will do it if we have to. Now, I don't want to end with how do we, you know, we slow, slow our product down. That's not fine. One of our product managers was just back there standing pictures. He's not taking a picture of us like slowing the product down. That's not, that's not what he's hoping for. We have some ways of speeding, speeding uh, our organization up. So for about a year, we have been working with something called feature gates. This idea that you can ship a feature all the way into the product, deep, even partially into the product, but in an inert state that uh, customers aren't going to hit it. There's no way it can damage the system. It can't make the system better or worse. But you can turn it on in the integration environment. And that is what really, it, for us, it, it flips the script on CI. I mean, you've, you know, we've been at this for two years. Everybody has had their code reverted once or twice. It's not, it's not fun, and eventually you get to feel like uh, what I call the, the Miranda rights of software development, where any, any test you write can and will be used to revert your code, and, and RoboCop is just you know, breaking down your door to, to just rip your code out. And you know, that is, you know, I might not write any more tests after I, I have a few of these kind of experiences, and that is, that is not what we want. You know, we, can, we cannot devolve into that. So with feature gates, it allows us to, to collect data in an integration environment for days or for weeks. And, and we can prove that, look, we have every bit of, of math on our side to show like we are making our product better. And when we do that, we can, we can get rid of uh, more and more of these sacred days in the in the development cycle where you got to get your stuff you know, to QE by this date. If not, you're out of the release. You've got to get it to you know, code complete by this date or you're out. You know, we, don't, we have fewer and fewer of those days which allow us to turn a feature on basically at any moment in the release cycle. You know, we're, we're deep into building release candidates. And hey, I haven't even heard of this feature, but the API team reviewed it, and they say, hey, they've got the test, they've got the data, uh, they're making our product better. There is no reason to hold back right now. So it really, it changes the, uh, the experience from, from, you know, from this, which is horrible, to something a little bit more like this. And, you know, we're like, okay, what is this? A bunch of people riding a bike over a mountain. You can imagine this is a Tour de France from, like, a long time ago. And what I mean here is these people... Um, they're on different teams. However, they actually work together in very fascinating ways. They, they, teams, rival teams will actually work together to go faster. And there's, there's no one person here who could, who could win all on their own. They have to rely on other teams, and together they are the fastest possible. And all this stuff that I'm saying about SRE, about reverting code, about sometimes slowing down, about even feature gates. If you've, you know, there's some people in this room that have done feature gates, and it is, it is very hard. It's a, it's a hard first lift to learn how to do it, and then it's, it's tough. But it does speed up our entire organization, uh, it, like, on the whole. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Um, sometimes we, we try to have a little bit of fun with SRE, but the work is not, I mean, it's like this, it's like going over a mountain. It's like, you, they don't look to me like they're having a lot of fun. Uh, but really that's not what SRE promises. It really just promises that you will go faster. So it never gets easier. You just go faster. This is the only real quote in this whole presentation. It's from Greg Lamont. He was one of the people in that uh, Tour de France uh, uh, image before, and, and that is it. Thank you so much. I uh, had a lot of fun. And I, I'm serious about Hacky Sack. It is in my pocket. Oh, it's right, it's right here. And uh, anytime you want to play, we can, we, can, we can play some Hacky Sack uh, this week. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask them. I don't know. I just want to say thank you, Brendan. Okay. I was on this journey with you for 
this is what five years yes. since I got hired six years ago. So like it's pretty incredible what the past about twelve years we have seen like you know, all the different iterations that you went through to get to the company that yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. That is that is very encouraging. Yeah, I have a question for you, Brent. Can you just dovetail on that? Um, oh, thanks. So, first of all, uh, you know, thank you from one of the developers who has to interface with what TRT and your team does inside Red Hat. I think the changes that you've made are visible to us, and I, my personal feeling is it is making the product better. But to shift away from that a little bit. You know, in the case of Red Hat, you showed some great links and like all of our test data is pretty much out there in the public internet and you know, our customers, our users can look at that. I'm curious, for organizations that might not be doing that, but are starting to make the SRE transition that you're talking about here, do you think that exposing this kind of data to customers makes a difference in their kind of you know, willingness to purchase or good feelings towards or, you know, does it make an impact in a customer? Yeah, we, we've had a, um, a few, let's just say a small number of customer interactions where someone uh, at the company um, finds out, like they see a presentation and it, it, they say, hey, would you come talk to my customer? And, and we give the talk and they're interested. Uh, uh, surprisingly enough, one of the, there was one customer and said, you know what we're the most interested about is that you're not using AI. <laughs> it's just, it's a hundred year old statistics. It's super boring and it's like at least understandable. That was shocking to me because we are actually thinking of like all kinds of ways that we can use AI to, to help us. Uh, you know, we would love to have that, um, you know, some of the things people were talking about in the, in the keynote for ourselves on our team, but it's really, it's really simple. And um, for us, statistics is going a long ways. Uh, so yeah, customers, some, some seem like they're, they're into it. Um, I, I think it also could be scary. We've had, had some customers, they look at our data and they're like, what are all these failures mean? It's like, we actually don't care about individual, we're, we're looking at trends and it's, it takes a little bit of, uh, it takes, you know, hopefully I'll, I'll have this recording and can send it to them. I think you have to have a little bit of context to uh, just look at our data. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Brent, a uh, long time listener, first time caller. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm interested in the team construction and where you went from who's on and who's off in terms of on call. He ended up with two weeks, three weeks off. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting about the continuity over two weeks that is less interesting of like one yeah. week? Yeah, the, the, so for we, I, that's a great question because what we'll say is we, when you're two weeks on, you're, there's like a primary and a secondary, and your primary one week, and then your, you know, sec, or your secondary your first week, and then your primary the second week. And that way, like, it just helps with a handoff. Yeah. Uh, we found like we just had to have two people. You know, um, we we had we would have one person for a while, but it's it is nice to have someone you can share your. Oh, this is literally one person. It's two people. It's two well, people. Well, one one person primary, one person secondary. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that makes a lot more sense even. Okay. Yeah. Um, did I answer your whole question? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, we, we tried smaller periods of time, but we settled on most of the problems. We, we have to solve them quickly because solving them slowly is impossible. If we can't solve it in one week, uh, it's probably going to get by us. Uh, I'll have a, probably a, hopefully another talk in the future that talks like, what are we doing about the things that get by uh, this process? Hey, Brenton. Uh, hey. Really appreciate your team's work. Uh, TRT carries OpenShift. <laughs> um, so my question is, uh, well, you know, uh, regressions only show up if they're not caught during pre-merge testing. What do you think? Um, how, how, how much how much testing belongs in pre-merge testing, and how much should we leave up to TRT? Yeah, well, the thing is, um, I didn't even get to like the, an interesting thing happened this week, and you know, I did couldn't put it in this talk, but some stuff was down that we rely on, like we couldn't actually even build for uh, a little while, 
and we didn't get all the same signals. So we actually have ways of getting signal from pre-merge testing. So what was happening was because we couldn't get our normal signal, our, our whole on-call team just switched to, started an, to start analyzing pre-merge testing and going to the developers first and just saying, hey, you would never believe this, but your PR, it's, it's starting to cause, we think it's related to this problem over here. Could you take a look? So they, they, they kind of jump into this uh, you know, pre-merge mode if they have to. But yeah, we can, we can talk. We have all kinds of things where we're trying to like give tools to developers to understand the pre-merge testing that we do. Yeah, yeah. That's what we could use AI for. We can find out like, Brinton, you should never be a developer. You know, you're going to cause too many regressions. All right, thank you. Thank you.